Değerli katılımcılar, değerli dostlar, sevgili öğrenciler, sizlere en içten dileklerimle, saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Bilindiği üzere 2020 yılı başlarından itibaren insanlık neredeyse aniden COVID-19 koronavirüs salgını ile baş başa kaldı ve hayatımızın her alanda zorlaştığı bir döneme girdik. Dünyada ve ülkemizde birçok araştırma ve eğitim etkinlikleri, toplantılar, çalıştaylar, yaz okulları iptal edildi ya da ertelendi. Bu duruma ilişkin oluşan bilimsel izolasyon, motiva, izolasyonun motivasyon krizi etkilerinin yaygınlaştığı bir dönemde TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü faaliyetlerini çevrim içi ortama taşıyarak var gücüyle devam ettirdi. Bu faaliyetler Temel bilimin çeşitli alanları ile disiplinler arası alanlarda toplam 6 ayrı ileri düzey seminer serisiyle bir bilimsel Türkiye popüler konuşmalar serisi şeklinde sınıflandırılarak gerçekleştirildi. Nobel ödüllü bilim insanları başta olmak üzere dünyaca ünlü bilim insanlarının katkıları ile gerçekleştirilen bu etkinliklerde ilgi alanlardaki en üst düzey ve yenilikçi bilgiler ülkemizin bilim ve eğitim camiasına aktarıldı. Bugün gelinen noktada enstitutumuzun yüz yüze seminerleri de başlamıştır. Ancak pandemi döneminde başlattığımız uzakları yakın eden ve zorlukları fırsata dönüştüren çevrim içi seminerlerimiz de devam etmektedir. Bu akşam yine bu vesileyle bir araya gelmiş bulunmaktayız. Bu akşamki seminerimiz Kimya Bilimleri Seminer Serimiz kapsamında ve İsviçre Federal Teknoloji Enstitüsü'nde çok değerli bir bilim insanı Profesör Maksim Kovalenko'nun katılımıyla gerçekleştirilecektir. Maksim Kovalenko, kurşun halojenur perboskit nanokristalleri ve süper floresens süper örgüleri konulu bir konuşma yapacaktır. Seminerimiz İngilizce olarak gerçekleştirilecektir. Dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, dear students, a very warm hello everyone and good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this episode of the Chemical Sciences Seminar Series of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences with the participation of Professor Maxim Kovalenko from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, Switzerland. Professor Kovalenko is a distinguished scientist and world-class expert in the field, as well as a wonderful person. He's going to give, to give a great talk on lead halide perovskite nanocrystals and the superfluorescent super lattices. Maxim Kovalenko is a professor of inorganic chemistry and the head of, of the functional inorganic materials group at ETH Zurich. The research activities of Maxim Kovalenko and his group focus on chemistry, physics, and application of inorganic solid state materials and nanostructures. In particular, present research efforts concern the precision synthesis of highly luminescent semiconductor nanocrystals. Nanocrystals surface chemistry, exploration of novel semiconductor materials by solution and solid state synthesis. Novel semiconductor for hard radiation detection, novel materials and concepts for lithium ion and post lithium ion rechargeable batteries. Many of these activities are strongly linked to industrial partners. Professor Kovalenko born and grew up in Ukraine, Bukovina region. He studied chemistry at the Chernovitsky National University and then continued at the Johannes Kepler University, Linz, Austria, 
where he obtained his PhD in 2007 under the supervision of Professor Wolfgang Hayes. Subsequently, he joined the University of Chicago for postdoctoral training with Professor Dmitry Talapin. He joined ETH Zurich in summer 2011 as a tenure track assistant professor and was prompted to an associated professor in January, January 2017. And finally, here he became a full professor in 2020. Professor Maxim Kovalenko has received a number of honors and awards, including Rosler Prize, highly cited researcher in 2018-2019, European Research Council Consolidated Grant 2018, Werner Prize 2016, and Ruzicka Prize 2013. With this, I want to invite Professor Maxim Kovalenka to stage to begin his talk. Maxim, please come. We are very honored to see you, and it is a very pleasure for us to see your title in Turkish on your slide. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you very much for your introduction and for such an honor to speak to such a broad, geographically and, uh, and scientifically audience. It's my great pleasure. So, as just announced, I'll, I'll speak about the specific topic in our group, which is um, uh, perovskite nanocrystals. And so my goal is to, to basically begin with the journey, how we, we started to work with these um, quantum dots uh, from historic perspectives through the lens of our own experience, and then uh, I will um, bring you to the most recent work, including unpublished results. And so it will hopefully cover the needs for those who just want to have a little bit of glimpse on the field, as well as those who might be working. I'm, I know in Turkey there are people working on perovskite nanocrystal. So those might, might enjoy then the most recent results. Uh, so this is our group. So these are the people who actually have, who actually work on this topic in our group. And, um, and uh, so actually you see here also people from Turkey back here to ready and uh, Yeshim. Uh, so uh, just to, to, to advertise right away that we are always happy to, uh, if, if there are young, talented and motivated students, postdocs applying to our group from Turkey, we will definitely consider their applications um, and uh, always respond to them. Now, uh, so as you can see on this t-shirt of the, uh, on the group members, this was a celebration actually of our group uh, 10 year last, uh, last summer. And so on the t-shirt, you see that perovskites have become one of the most interesting um, materials for us both from the basic research point of view, so nuclear magnetic resonance to applications such as uh, light emitting diodes and uh, photodetectors, for example. Um, now, uh, one second. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Okay, and I would like to also acknowledge the funding sources which support our research, as mentioned from ERC, to national uh, and international funding agencies. So for those who would like to hear a little bit of the history of, um, of quantum dots, um, well, it's a 40 years old history from the initial discovery of quantum size effects. But if we talk about colloidal nanocrystals, colloidal semiconductors, uh, the milestone, the first milestone was in 1993 cadmium sunlight quantum dots had been produced in a very monodispersed um, form uh, as, a, as a colloidal dispersion. So basically uh, you have inorganic core of one material, calcite coated with uh, organic monolayer of another material. And so basically this research had been super fascinating since early on because 
simply by changing the, the dimension of these nanocrystals within the few nanometer range, you could uh, tailor the, um, the band gap energy uh, uh, uh, through the quantum size effects. And therefore the color of these dots uh, range from, covers the whole visible spectral range. So that was super exciting. And if uh, uh, some of you wish to learn more about nanocrystals in general, they have, well, 3,000 3, years old history. Um, and that's what we recently published in such a sort of historic perspective. But speaking of semiconductor nanocrystals, which we call quantum dots, these, these are roughly 30 years old. Now, what, what was also not super exciting from the beginning was to notice that, that the light emissive property of this quantum dot was not that great at all. And the problem back then was that, um, um, that quantum dots as produced, they do not exhibit um, bright luminescence. And luminescence, as you know, this is a reversal of the absorption, right? So that photogenerated electron hole pair recombines back. And uh, the big hope for these materials was that they will emit light with high luminescence quantum efficiency and therefore they can be used as, as uh, inorganic nano-sized light emitters. But they turn to be very bad light emitters as produced. And the reason for that was that the, the, the, the surface which quantum dots have, you know, they have very high surface to volume ratio. And the surface is basically made of dangling bonds. Basically you cut the lattice you create dangling bonds. So basically orbitals which are not binding and not anti-binding. And so they are mid gap states, right? Uh, which exist localized on the surface. And they are capable, even in a very small quantity, they are capable to quench uh, electron or hole, therefore, uh, thereby uh, basically uh, preventing efficient uh, luminescence. So what people have done since very early on, they focused on how to resolve this problem. And uh, the first high quality demonstration of this concept of core shell nanocrystal goes back to Philip Giosioni in 96. What he showed is that if you now take this quantum dot material and overgrow it with another semiconductor, which has a wider band gap, but the same crystal structure, you can actually now decouple in space the existence of these dangling bonds at the surface and the localization of electron and hole wave functions to the core. The simple concept uh, turned to be um, experimentally mm, demanding because you need to sort of maintain monodispersity, you need to homogeneously in three dimensions overgrow the nanocrystal and you better also create a graded shell so that the, that, the, that the band gap gradient is smooth and, um, and that the overall quantum dot size is, uh, is sufficiently large to fully decouple the surface states from the core. So it actually took about a decade to engineer quantum dots to such quality that they have been then utilized as um, uh, as phosphors in the television displays. So by now, uh, this application in television displays is by far the most important application of, uh, of such um, uh, semiconductor quantum dots, uh, which are emissive in the visible spectral range. There are also infrared applications, which we will not discuss much, but those then extend to, let's say, infrared cameras, where they do the opposite function. They absorb light and, and and uh, generate electron hole pairs. But here today, we focus exclusively on the probably main property of quantum dots, which is light generation. And so what you see on the market is that three five-based quantum dots are left slightly behind initially, but then they cut up and now they are the dominant quantum dot uh, television display technology from Samsung, for example, but also a few other companies. So all these dots, which you see on the screen are commercial um, uh, uh, products and you see them in some of the best quality LCD 
uh, displays best quality in terms of emission colors and energy efficiency and uh, so forth and brightness. Now, we were used to believe that these Playground is basically just two, five, uh, two six and three five compounds uh, until 2013, when um, these semiconductors uh, known as lead halide perovskites have been rediscovered as uh, optoelectronic materials. Initially in the semiconductor uh, solar cell uh, as, a, as a semiconductive absorber uh, for solar cells. So just to be briefly introduce, they are called perovskites because they have exactly the same crystal structure as oxides, which have perovskite crystal lattice, such as calcium titanate, but they are not made of those elements. They are made of lead and halide. So the valences here are a factor of two smaller than these, but the crystal structure is the same. So that's why they are called lead halide perovskites. Now, uh, those again have band gap tunable across the visible spectral range here by composition in the bulk form. And so, uh, so you might know that, um, oh, this is, uh, this is by, uh, this should not have appeared here, this was the, um, uh, so basically the quantum, uh, the, the, uh, the color conversion uh, efficiencies, uh, sorry, not color, the power conversion efficiencies of this perovskite based quantum dots uh, perovskite-based uh, absorbers have become comparable to the classical semiconductors such as gallium arsenide, silicon, and cadmium telluride. And so back then, we in 2013, we understood that inherently halides um, make for a good semiconductor. So why don't we use them now as a coating for uh, perovskite um, for conventional quantum dots? So we take a perovskite, as a, as a shell to code the conventional quantum dot instead of using the core shell strategy. And so that was super exciting because we were able to use the soluble forms of these, uh, of these perovskites, they are called halometallates, to use them as a surface capping ligand. So we displace organic ligands, we cover the surface with, uh, with this halometallate uh, coating. And because of that, um, uh, we could basically uh, fully change the surface um, uh, functionality from apolar to highly polar. And that you see from the, the dispersion of these, of these nanocrystals, they migrate from the apolar phase into a polar phase upon this ligand exchange. And uh, what was extremely important back then is to observe that such an, such an, such an exchange uh, can preserve or even improve the electronic state of the surface. So somehow it turned to be very beneficial to have halides at the surface uh, as compared to calcogenides, for example. And so that you see from the retention of high quantum efficiency for the luminescence uh, in the visible and in the infrared spectral range and so forth. So this on its own has become a very popular research area because you can have now quantum dots which are fully inorganic and which you can then electronically connect to each other. And they still maintain intrinsic semiconductor nature. So they are used actually in uh, such quantum dots kept with hollow metallates are used in photodetectors and solar cells and some other applications. But, we will not focus on those. We will just proceed with what we did uh, as chemists. We understood that, okay, if a perovskite is good as a coating for the usual quantum dot, why don't we make the entire quantum dot out of perovskite? So that was our um, entry point into the world of uh, perovskite quantum dots. And since then, we basically, uh, basically uh, keep working on that because everything we do since then is super exciting and I will share with you some of that, uh, of those uh, observations. So in 2014, we began to work on a colloidal synthesis now of perovskite quantum dots. We focused initially on cesium lead halides 
fully inorganic. And simply at by reacting two very simple precursors in the presence of such long chain molecules, you produce nanocrystals which are cubic in shape and which are quite monodispersed. And it was easy to extend this simple synthesis to basically the entire family of these lightly light perovskites, which is formamidinium uh, and cesium based. And, uh, and uh, what was super exciting by exam that as you produce them, they emit very bright light. So you don't need to overcoat them with any other semiconductor. As they are, they are bright emitters because apparently their surfaces are relatively benign. They don't introduce mid-gap states. So, and that is the first example of uh, wide band gap semiconductors, which whose surfaces are relatively benign uh, with respect to the electronic uh, behavior. So what was also very exciting is to observe that now you can mix different ions uh, and create multinary perovskite nanocrystals, which is that you can uh, mix A site, cesium and formamidinium or halide, so you can have solid solutions. And therefore you can control the band gap by composition. So you can have phase pure multi-component nanocrystal, which is very difficult to do with calcogenides, for example. Um, so you may be wondering why they are always cubic shaped. That has something to do with both, with the intrinsic crystal structure, because perovskite lattice is derived from a cubic-like crystal structure, but it's also essential to consider which surface facets are stable. And so in our first synthesis, as you might recall from the slide before, we use primary amine, which converts into ammonium, a long chain of kill ammonium capping ligand. And um, another example is shown on this slide, which is dialkyl ammonium. So this is ammonium group, which is positively charged and two alkyl chains. So these cationic surfactants or ligands bind to the surface by displacing the surface cesium ion on the 100 terminated crystal plane. And so just replacement, let's say of the 50% of the surface cesium uh, yields such a stable, um, stable surface facet. And so because of this mechanism, uh, your nanocrystal definitely prefers to uh, expose only one zero zero facets and therefore you end up with a cubic shape. As a little spoiler, I will show you that you can actually use some other ligands and therefore you will have different shape. But in the initial first edition of this material, we had a cubic shape nanocrystal. Now let me, start speaking of the problems now. Before you understand the problem, let me show you how the synthesis looks like. You inject cesium oleate into lead bromide solution and you see immediate appearance of quantum dots. They are green emitters. So the reaction is completed within the mixing rate, which looks very exciting, right? So you very quickly can produce grams or kilograms of these quantum dots. At the same time, such a fast reaction is a problem if you want to have very fine control of the size, especially down to very small sizes, or if you want to grow some heterostructures and so forth. So um, for about six years from this initial, uh, the first edition of the synthesis, we used only this type of chemistry, which was very fast because the ions co-precipitate very rapidly. But then two years ago, we began to explore a new synthesis pathway, which allowed us, and I show you the outcome of that new synthesis, uh, which was just published the last month. Here you see that you can actually have this whole synthesis much slower. So you see this absorption spectra of these quantum dots measured within 30 minutes. So this whole progression is half an hour instead of one second or less. So now you have a synthesis, which is 
much slower, much easier to control, and everything occurs at room temperature. So you don't need to even heat it up. So you may ask, what, what did we change? So the idea here is that we avoid using any amine in the system because when you have amine, it will become ammonium. And if you have ammonium, you will need to have a counter ion, which is lead bromate, cesium lead bromide three minus, uh, uh, says, uh, sorry, lead bromide three uh, single minus, which is too reactive. So you better do not have active ionic species in the solution. You should go as molecular as you can, and therefore you will have much slower nucleation in your in uh, one way to accomplish that, and I believe there are many ways to accomplish this, but one is that you, again, you don't use any amine. Uh, you use lead bromide and triactyl phosphine oxide as a molecular adduct, which dissolve at room temperature in hexane, and you inject a cesium salt. So only cesium in this synthesis is in the ionized form, more or less. As uh, the other precursor is fully molecular. And you see the absorption spectrum of this lead bromide topo adduct in the uh, UVV spectrum. Then as you mix them, they slowly start to react, uh, forming uh, lead uh, dopa, which is phosphine, phosphinate of some, of some kind, doesn't matter too much, and uh, an actual intermediate. So now, uh, you form this cesium lead bromide, but not a lattice, but a conglomerate of ions, which is cesium plus and lead bromide three minus. It's a, it's a three nanometer large uh, junk of ions, which are pre-aggregated. And then they slowly recrystallize into the nuclei of the nanocrystal, and then you form a nanocrystal. So that's our current understanding of the, of the mechanism. Beauty here is that for lead bromides, you can actually observe all the relevant species in situ during the synthesis. Precursor itself, then at, at slightly smaller energies, you observe this intermediate. And then finally you observe the, the quantum dots. Um, and so just by measuring in situ optical absorption spectrum, you can actually recalculate these features, their intensity, their optical density into the population of every species so you can track the mechanism of the reaction. And just to give you an idea, you can actually observe that your nanocrystal size, quantum dot, um, um, your nanocrystal quantity uh, will uh, rise, the concentration of quantum dots, and then saturate. That means you have reached the plateau in your concentration and in your size. That you know then that at this moment of time, the whole reaction is finished. And then you can isolate your nanocrystal in a high yield. So just to give you an idea, um, this synthesis is so much more convenient and better controlled that we now entirely shift to this approach. Now, uh, one of the reasons why this synthesis is beneficial is that you can also uh, expand it to hybrid perovskites, which have been uh, traditionally very difficult to produce because they are much more fragile. And now we can produce formamidinium lead bromide or methyl ammonium lead bromide with the same degree of the, of the size down to very small sizes. So with this new synthesis, you can reach, you can isolate extremely small nanocrystal sizes down to three nanometers. Uh, in a large quantity and with the retention of the stability through, throughout the purification. But what's also very special is that your dots are no longer cubic, they can be of spherical shape. And the reason here is exactly what we discussed before is that uh, you no longer use amines in the synthesis. So this mechanism of 100 lattice plane um, uh, stabilization doesn't hold anymore. You're, you don't have any ligand which binds very strongly in the system, which is a blessing and a curse. It's blessing because you can, uh, you can actually then use such a synthesis for 
uh, as a first step to functionalize your nanocrystals with any ligand that we want. You can put then any molecule of an, that will have high affinity to the surface because in the synthesis, you don't have any such molecule. So you can decouple the formation of nanocrystals from their subsequent surface functionalization. The curse, of course, is that you have to do it rapidly because otherwise nanocrystals after the growth will start coalescing and uh, recrystallizing to bulk material. In this case, right after you reach the plateau in the nanocrystal formation, you now add the ligand of, of the choice and you can stabilize nanocrystal. And any ligand that we used before, but as well as any ligand which we will discover in future can be now tested in a very rational manner uh, is through this approach. So this brings me to the surface um, studies. Ah, by the way, just to show you that you can also produce mixed halide compositions um, by mixing bromides and chlorides. Um, you can then uh, scale the band gap by the, uh, by the composition or by size or by composition. Now, uh, now, the most important part of the whole story is, of course, the surface chemistry. So, what is the problem with the surface chemistry of perovskites and how to resolve it? Um, most of nanocrystals, cadmium selenide, gold, nearly everything, uh, bind to the ligands through covalent bonds. Siles, for example, on the surface of gold, they attach very strongly because of very strong sulfur gold bond. Oleate on the surface of cadmium selenide attaches through rather strong uh, carboxylate of cadmium uh, bond. Perovskites are very soft ionic species. So you cannot play with the covalent attachment of ligands here because if you attach something covalently like siles, you will actually destroy the nanocrystal because the binding of your ligand to your ion will be much stronger than between the ions inside the legs. So you've got to deal with these ionic surfaces in a, in a smarter way than covalent attachment. Now, as you've seen, when we use alkyl ammonium ligands, they do bind non-covalently, they replace cesium. So this is an example here, as we discussed before, such a alkyl ammonium displaces surface cesium ion and inserts the help group into, the, into this pocket. Now, similar approach you can do with anionic ligands. They will displace surface halide and insert themselves. But even bigger problem is that it's easy to overdo this because as you add more of these ionic ligands, they start carving into your material, they etch it. And it's always tricky to find the balance. And so then we thought several years ago how to, um, to make it, to, to, to run this ligand functionalization in a, in a rather, rather softer manner and yet bind our ligands even stronger. So we came a few years ago, we came to the idea to use Twitter ionic ligands, where there is, this is a good example, where you have positive and negatively charged group in one molecule. And so now this, this group will attach to the surface by displacing a pair of cation and an ion in, at the surface. And that worked. So one example is lecithin. It's a natural phospholipid. You find it in chocolate and in many other products, very cheap. It works uh, uh, uh, wonderfully. Um, and so now we started to ask ourselves, do we really understand fully how these ligands actually attach to the surface, these Twitter ionic ligands? And because of our new synthesis, we thought if we better understand how the ligands attach, then it will give us some design rules how to engineer the head groups and the tails. And then we can attach all kinds of phospholipids uh, to our nanocrystals and, and check the whole library of them. And so, so we now undertook over the last uh, year or so 
mixed experimental slash uh, theoretical study where we uh, first analyzed how the Twitter ion binds to the surface through molecular dynamics. And in parallel, we started to test different head groups and different tails of this of these phospholipids and see how that allows us to make our colloidal systems even better. Without going too much into detail, I will just tell you that we tested several possibilities, such as attachment of, of a ligand simply by adhering to the surface, or displacive attachment, where, which we initially assumed, where the phospholipid displaces a pair of ions and incorporates itself into the AX terminated 100 facet. So our conclusions are that this binding mode three is uh, much more likely than the, any other one uh, de depicted on the, on, on, the, on the slide. But most interesting finding was also to question whether this typical for phospholipids uh, quaternary ammonium moiety is ideal or not. Because in principle, this is a permanently charged cation and it sounds like it's a good group, but it's a little bit bulky for this, for this site. And so we then checked what if we take a primary ammonium group, which is three hydrogens inst instead of three methyl groups. And when you take uh, this version, the one which is um, the one which is uh, primary ammonia. Uh, so we call it PIA, uh, so which is um, phosphoethanolamine. So this group is phosphoethanolamine. Uh, and just to, for the sake of language, this is phosphocholine and this is phosphoethanolamine. We find that this ligand, because the size of this group is, uh, is quite, quite a bit smaller than the, than the trimethyl ammonium group, uh, this one binds much better to the pocket, which is initially occupied by cesium. And, um, and, um, and so basically it, it binds much better to the surface such that you can actually have a full uh, monolayer coverage uh, of, uh, of, the, of the surface with a phospholipid of this kind. And so this correlates well with subsequent experiments. So what experiments have shown that indeed, if you take exactly same uh, organic uh, rest here and just compare the PIA group with phosphocholine group, like shown here. On the day one, these colloidal solutions will, will, will look similar, but a few days later, you'll notice a big difference because the, the PIA-based ligand desorbs much slower than the than the one which is phosphocholine based. Basically in good agreement also with the simulations uh, showing this much more stable um, uh, binding. Um, now, um, with this knowledge, we have tested the whole library of ligands. So we kept PIA based uh, Twitter ionic uh, phospholipid group and we engineered a lot of different organic residues. And this is for the first time that you can have perovskite nanocrystals dispersible in basically every solvent that you may come up with, except water, because in water, the material itself dissolves, the perovskite material. But now you can disperse perovskite nanocrystals in alcohols, in acetone, or in very apolar solvents. And you simply accomplish that by uh, by the group which you bind to your phospholipid. So uh, let me show you then um, uh, also another uh, aspect, which is, excuse me, somehow, yeah. So this is how you make these ligands. Uh, there is extensive art of the, of the synthesis of phospholipids because in biochemistry and in, uh, in lots of, in, in life science oriented uh, chemistry, uh, this is used ex extensively because many phospholipids are, are medications, for instance, against cancer, or they're used uh, to produce capsules, for instance, uh, for vaccines, for example. And so this is one of the most developed chemistry to synthesize um, 
uh, phospholipids. And we just adopted that and uh, produced phospholipids of, the, of different kinds as capping ligands for the nanocrystal. So this work will be published in the next um, couple of months. Let me show you another aspect, which is possible with perovskites and not easy to, to do with anything else, which is now you can also engineer the, the perovskite itself. Perovskite lattice is, is very soft. So you can actually display some of your inorganic constituents with organic ones, maintaining the lattice. So the lattice will not collapse, even if you displace up to 10% of the core material by another organic material. And so you can keep the nanocrystal size, you can, uh, but you will drastically modify the electronic structure. For example, you can actually engineer such materials uh, these hollow perovskite materials, what you see on the screen, that you will have exactly the same emission color, but you will have different radiative rates. And we uh, have used it, not shown here, but we have used it to engineer the, um, the unicolor security tags by injured printing. You can find it in this uh, publication from the last year. So this brings me to a summary of the optical property. And so, and the, and the part two of my presentation. So, so by now we, we have all these luminescent nanocrystals. And as you have noticed, they can be used for television displays. And, and indeed, there are companies worldwide which now develop prototype displays with perovskites in China, also in Switzerland. And, but looking in future, Perovskite nanocrystals are also extremely interesting as a quantum light source. And, um, and uh, I will briefly cover that, but more about our vision in that regard and challenges you can find in the recent uh, review articles. So very early on from 2016, our colleagues within Zurich uh, at IBM, they have they, they, they began looking at, um, at um, single particle emission with perovskites. So here you see single part, particle uh, spectrum. Uh, and um, somehow my screen is freezing. Um, one second. Yeah, now it starts to react. Okay, so here you see the, the emission spectrum from a single quantum dot as a, as, a, as a function of time. So it's a stable single photon emission. Uh, there is clear single um, photon emission uh, confirmed by the anti-bunching experiment and these quantum dots do not blink much. Um, just to put it in perspective, before the perovskite quantum dots, all the other kinds of, of the colloidal quantum dots have been unstable, they blinked a lot, and at such large sizes, they had not been uh, single photon emitters. So, so what this led us to, uh, and, and let's look at some other important properties, which are very specific to perovskites. One is that at low temperatures, they are extremely fast light emitters, one of the fastest emitters that you can find. Unlike to conventional quantum dots, which become much slower emitters as you call them. So their radiative rates are in microsecond range because they begin emitting through the dark exciton state. Perovskites emit through the bright exciton state, also at low temperatures and with sub nanosecond radiative rates. Uh, they, and what was also extremely exciting, and this is essential for the future is that they can retain at low temperatures their exciton coherence uh, for a decent fraction of their radiative rate, radiative lifetime. And so basically they are reasonably coherent emitters at the single photon level. And this motivates to build collective states where potentially these single emitters might couple into, uh, into larger uh, aggregate states with coherent emission as a as a, as a collective state. And so one way to design such, uh, such aggregate states would be to 
self-assemble quantum dots into superstructures. And so um, here again, we look at the history where people have used a dry mediated self-assembly of nanocrystals to generate long range other super lattices. You simply can take a monodispersed colloid of, um, of um, nanocrystals of spherical shape. You can dry out the solvent and you will end up with a super lattice. This is known for cadmium selenide for uh, several decades now. How it works is because it works that easily only for the colloids, which are so-called sterically stabilized, which is apolar capping ligands like we have for perovskites. And so that the particles experience very short range repulsion, but they, they rather are non-interacting at the, at the longer distances. So this steep interparticle potential in a good solvent. So this occurs also when you choose the solvent correctly. It has to be a polar small molecule solvent. When you have that case, nanocrystals will undergo spontaneously into uh, into self-assembly, they will undergo self-assembly into other states because at the late stage of drying, they maximize the free, uh, the free volume uh, entropy, essentially. And um, even though there is a, they sacrifice the configurational entropy, uh, you still get overall small entropy increase through the conversion into the ordered state at the very late stage of drying. And then the solvent evapor evaporates fully and then you are locked into a super lattice. And for spheres, you will end up with the structure, which is uh, one of the densest sphere packing, which is face-centered cubic or hexagonal closed packing. Now you can ask, what about cubes? For cubes, it's much simpler. Cubes form super cubes, which is 100% space occupation. And, um, and so this, naturally, these were the first super lattices whose optical properties we examined at low temperatures. So these large supercubes can be as large as 10, 20 micron, and they can be produced as single entities on the substrate. And this is an electron microscopy of these. Now, when you cool to low temperature, you, what was super exciting about five years ago, when our colleagues have observed these a sharp, uh, uh, emission bands at lower energies than your normal excitonic band, which suggests some coupling. And this is a coupling, uh, incoherent coupling um, uh, of, these, of these entities. And, that's, uh, and then as, as you start increasing the power density for your excitation, you start seeing the shortening of the radiative rate without losing the, the quantum efficiency, which means that you have pure acceleration of emission. So what happens is that your initially incoherently excited uh, quantum dots build coherence across themselves if they are in, in a sufficiently close proximity. And for this effect, they have to be something like within the half a wavelength from each other. So if, if in that volume, you have a sufficient number of photo excited quantum dots, they start building coherence across themselves and establish large um, multi-particle dipoles, which emit coherently then, and which emit light and uh, with a faster radiative rate because they have a higher oscillator strength. So basically, as you can imagine, the higher will be the, the density of these photo excited dots, the higher is power density for your station, the larger will be this coherent state, and therefore the faster will be the emission. And that's exactly what we see. And in addition, because it takes time to build the coherence and then it emits and then it circles, you have this uh, sort of this um, oscillations in the radiative rate and you have dynamic shift because as you radiate, you lose the stabilization energy from the coupling. So it goes back to the bluer, uh, uh, bluer um, uh, energies. And you nicely see these oscillations if you compare it as uh, the, the the, the radiative decays at different uh, excitation densities. And you also see this um, linear dependence between light in and light out. 
and uh, which speaks for the purely radiative nature of, of everything that you observe. So this property is called superfluorescence, and we were very excited to observe that because it's simply the first chemically produced um, uh, quantum dot system which exhibits this property. So far, it had been observed in very few cases, which is epitaxial quantum dots of one kind, as well as some of the atomically doped alkali metal halides, or even in some of the gases such as hydrogen fluoride. But now you have a solid state system where you can tune this property potentially through composition, through size, through nanocrystal assembly, and you can basically engineer this property. It's not that you just can observe it. And so we were extremely motivated to, to try to engineer this property further. And so, and so then we thought, okay, as chemists, we can build more complex superstructures, not only simple cubic packing into super cubes, but we can combine perovskite quantum dots with some other materials or dielectric spacer quantum dots such that we can mutually orient the perovskite light emitters and see how that helps or not to build the, the, these coherent states, these collective states. Again, back in history, Roughly 20 years ago, the first examples of binary nanocrystal self-assemblies had been reported by Chris Murray and his colleagues, who simply mixed two spheres of different sizes, sterically stabilized, as we discussed. And then upon solvent evaporation, they have observed these crystal structures, which are identical to what you know in the atomic world, except that it's now built of uh, nanocrystals as artificial atoms. And so uh, when you speak of spheres, you can observe these types of structures um, of different kinds. And uh, in, the, in the inset here, you see the actual crystal structure analog in the atomic world. So it can be as simple as sodium chloride or as complicated as some intermetallic type of structures. And so in our work, we set to ask ourselves, okay, we have cubic shaped nanocrystals. Uh, will that matter? And then you look in the literature and you find that nobody actually ever made binary lattices where, where, where you mix non-spherical nanocrystals, um, particularly cubic ones. And so I have brilliant students and one of them, Ihor Chernyuk, has made titanic work on basically on, uh, on first producing the library of these shapes with extremely extreme control of the monodispersity, cubes, spheres, uh, truncated cubes, disks, thin disks, thick disks, and he combined cubes with all kinds of other nanocrystals, um, trying to build multi-component super lattices. It's basically at the limits of what synthetic chemistry can do in the in a, at the mesoscale. And so, so what we expect is that perovskites actually are soft cubes. Imagine the nanocrystal, it has this very rigid cubic core and it has these ligands and ligands are soft. They can bend, they can deform. So, so there is certain softness and the Smaller is the cube, the greater is the soft, softness because the volume occupied by the ligand increases. So, so to minimize the softness, we actually stick to the ligand, which is shortest of all, which can still provide colloidal stability, which is the one I already showed you in some of the previous slides. And then we took two kinds of cubes. One is the bigger one, which is harder and the smaller one, which is soft. So the effective size of the cube is the core plus the ligand length. And then we thought, okay, this lattice is known for spheres. Can we make it out of cubes? And now the rule of thumb here is the following, that you need to mix the sizes of your spheres or, or a cube plus sphere in a certain range where the resulting packing density for this, for this uh, lattice will be the highest. Because unlike two atoms where you cannot really change the, the size, here you can. 
And so here you see that, for instance, uh, when you mix two spheres, they will have high packing density uh, only in a specific size range. And uh, only then you will have this lattice more stable than the phase separation into single component lattices. So basically you compete against phase separation and you will win this competition only if your resulting lattice is denser or similarly dense. So with cubes, it's actually even easier because the cube of the same uh, diameter as the sphere is larger. And so you can get actually higher packing densities when you switch from a sphere to a cube. And we tested this and we indeed, and there were theoretical predictions that this is the case, even years before our work. And indeed we observe a super lattice where the perovskite cube is surrounded by these spheres of iron oxide or or another compound, or these, uh, so, or uh, yes, in this case it's iron oxide, but also can be some dielectric material. Um, excuse me, the, the, the computer is seems to freeze a little bit. Um, just a second. Okay, so yes, it's another kind of. Uh, it's a dielectric sphere, sodium gadolinium fluoride, and, and you do get, again, the same type of a crystal structure. Now, we have observed much more interesting structures, but before you will understand why they form, let me also bring your attention to the fact that your ligand shell is not only deformable, but it can deform in a very specific manner. As that was observed uh, years ago, and was invoked to explain the stability of some of the binary all sphere assemblies, which would otherwise would be hard to explain. So what can happen is that when two spheres approach each other, the smaller one, the ligands on the smaller one can bend away, can, make, can create these vertices, and therefore they can uh, allow a more compact light so that these uh, two spheres can approach each other closer uh, when one of the spheres can uh, bend away their ligands. And so this is stabilizing the higher packing density. So if that happens, you can expect that your overall stability of the lattice will be fair because you can stuff much more material per volume, per unit volume. And uh, for spheres, this has a um, noticeable effect only in those structures where you have small coordination numbers. If the coordination number is high, there is simply no space to bend away these ligands. Now, when you go to an isotropic shape or less, it's actually isotropic, but a sharper shape, cube. Imagine a cube impinging the sphere with the edge. And so this sharp contact will very likely lead to the bending of the ligands so that the cube and sphere can come closer to each other. By the way, this must happen also when two cubes approach each other through the edge or through the corner. And so this, this, is a, this happens indeed. And this has a stabilizing effect so that you can have lattice which is denser than without the ligands bending. And so, so that's unique property of these uh, sharper uh, shapes which allows to observe new crystal structures. And let me show you one very prominent example of such a crystal structure. Look at this mixture of two spheres, which I already tell you, had never been observed experimentally. So only atoms form this crystal lattice, but nanocrystals with at any size ratio, two spheres never crystallize in this crystal structure. This is nickel 4 n type lattice, which is, which is basically derived from the perovskite lattice uh, when the uh, facet and the, and the center atom is the same. Now, again, computer is freezing again. Um, one second. I probably will stop sharing and restart the presentation. Okay. Yes, it should work now. 
So, um, mm -hmm. so, all right. And so, and uh, if you compute the, the packing density at any size ratio, this lattice is indeed unstable. But now, um, now when you mix a cube and a sphere, you do get the perovskite type lattice because already without any assumption of ligand deformation, at least it's in some narrow size ratio, you have very high density. But if you assume in addition, the, the ligand deformation, you will expect even broader range of stability. And then we check this range experimentally and we indeed observed that cubes and spheres do form such a lattice and they form it very, uh, this lattice is very much favorite compared to the phase separation. So uh, you end up with a very nice, very clean yield of this structure. Uh, it outcompetes phase separation by far. And um, let me just, um, let me show you that you can see it nicely in three-dimensional electron microscopy. You can observe it by all the techniques which prove this lattice from, uh, from X-ray diffraction to electron diffraction to direct observation in transmission microscopy. So it's a, it's a very peculiar example because you build perovskite super lattice out of perovskite based nanocrystals. And so just for the last few minutes, I will show you that indeed these structures do show super fluorescence as well. So, and what is more interesting is that are you indeed, if you compare different kinds of super lattices, you start seeing correlation between the structure and the super fluorescence that you observe. For example, in one case, you even see the blue shifted super fluorescence. In another case, you see the super fluorescence um, threshold for the appearance as a function of the dielectric sphere diameter. And in another case, you see that you do not observe superfluorescence because the volume fraction of these, um, how many particles of perovskite that you have per volume is here much smaller than in such type of a super lattice. So you start correlating your superfluorescent property with your uh, structure. And to show you yet another possibility is that you can start building fully ternary lattices where also the center cube can be a different type of cube. You can put a, if you take a large, a mixture of smaller cubes and larger cubes in a specific particle number ratio and size ratio, you can actually build a lattice where preferably a, a bigger cube will go into the center of a unit cell because crystallographically this side is a little bit larger and therefore for geometric fitness, this cube will go over there. So this is very tedious experimental work because you need to control the sizes very precisely. But once you do that, you can produce such ternary structures as well, and you can fully characterize them. And we have discovered the whole bunch of new lattices, which I will skip because of the time matter. But I will just tell you that also when you combine cubes and disks, you again will observe new lattices, which you cannot see when you combine spheres and disks, because these structures have higher packing density. As you can see, for instance, if you compare the space filling curves for this case versus the space filling curve for the sphere disk mixture. And so we have discovered the library of these ones uh, for different sh sh sizes of disks and sizes of cubes. And again, there is a structure property correlation in the, in the, in the superfluid. Now, this is a structure of calcium carbide type where you now see that, um, that you can occupy one lattice side by two cubes. And then you will have this very nice lattice. So for those who are interested to see details of that, there is a recent publication where we have covered all the structures which we have observed so far in one article. So for those who, are, who care for that, you can see the details in that paper. 
and I will skip the rest and show you that you can now start co-assembling the perovskite nanocrystals with molecular large giant inorganic clusters. And that's also ongoing work where we generate uh, super lattices, which are sort of at the, at the interface of the atomically defined world, which is clusters and nanocrystals, which are, uh, which are non-atomically defined. And that is the future work. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any question related to this work. Maxim, thank you, you very much uh, for this very comprehensive and intriguing talk. Thank you. Now we can take some questions. Please ask questions or send questions to the chat area. Yes, questions, please. I see one. Yes. Yes, sure, you can ask questions. Serhat, please ask. And another question, questions, uh, question please, uh, came from Oz Gülseren. So the, the, the question from August, what is nature of, gates of aggregate state that led to single photon emission, excitonic state? So just to clarify, single photon emission we get from a single quantum dot not from aggregated states. So we, we do not, we, we produce a sample where the individual dots are very well separated on the substrate. So very diluted system. And then we look with the microphotoluminescence at a single particle. Um, and, um, and basically that is how we observe. And yes, it has excitonic nature. So when you have defects, the luminescence is quenched and so you don't see any emission. And here, we, whenever we see single photon emission, it comes at the, exactly the energy of the, of the exciton. Uh, so, um, perovskite dope glasses. Another question is from Itac, from Itac about the perovskite dope glasses. Very good question. Uh, uh, in literature, you write there is an increasing number of works where people produce perovskite quantum dots um, by melting the precursors together with the precursors for the glass. And then when they anneal it, they produce perovskites in the glass, similar to one of the actually very first examples of quantum dots in the history 40 years ago. So this is indeed a very good idea. And I believe that um, such such perovskite in a glass systems uh, have intrinsic advantages potentially because the perovskites are very well protected from water and the environment. The only problem that I see is that because I keep I keep uh, keep up with the literature on that because I thought we we, we may want to do that too, is that the quantum yields which people report are actually lower than in the colloidal system. Tip, the best quantum yields I've seen are like 50, maybe sometimes 70%, but usually less, like 10, 10 to 30%. And that can be explained by the fact that in this process of annealing, there are other phases formed which, which absorb light. And also the, uh, the defects are probably not, uh, the trap states are not well uh, taken care of. So, to me, this is uh, the only problem. Um, okay, now the next question I see in the chat, uh, where can I, from Roman, uh, where I can find these papers and perovskite related topics? 
what is uh, luminous intensity of these QDs? Can they be used in place of LDs and laser in optic fiber? So, to make it short, if you don't find papers, write to me. I will send you the needed papers. And um, your specific question is luminous intensity of these QDs, and can they be used in place of LEDs? Of course, they, they are used in, in, um, in LEDs in, uh, as, as actually as electroluminescent layer, as well as, as down converting layer. So people do measure, uh, do use them both ways. Um, Serhat wrote his que their question. I measured decay time of cesium light bromine nearly 20 nanoseconds. Your research shows it about one, two nanoseconds. My QD sample was from a company based in the UK. That means we had different type of or another problems that I had. Very interesting question. Um, this um, quantum yield of one to two nanoseconds is what we see in the colloidal dispersion when the dots are non-interactive. When they start to interact, when you make film, you can have electronic delocalization or reversible trapping of, uh, of a charge. And altogether, this may lead to apparently longer um, radiative rates. I assume you measured actually these 20 nanoseconds not in a colloidal dispersion. Um, another factor which matters is the is the size of quantum dots. So the, uh, the larger dots might, uh, will have a bit longer radiative rates. Um, then the next question, can you give us details of the procedure for compositional ternary ABO3 superlatives on slide 54? Oh yes, you should just should, uh, should write to us. And we can um, we can uh, uh, send you the details. It's also published in the paper. But if you find that the paper doesn't give you the needed detail, uh, please write to me or to the first author of the Nature article, which is Igor Chernyuk, and he will gladly provide you the needed detail. We will be happy if you can if you are working on reproducing that. We will be happy that you do reproduce it. So that your result is um, is to your satisfaction. Now, Sir Hat uh, writes: I tried to use them as a scintillator for its rays. I my answer to that is that I hope you had good results. But my my doubt about scintillators generally, based on perovskites, is that. If your goal is to make a scintillator with good light yield, with uh, you need to have thick absorber layer. And uh, with perovskites, which have very small stock shift be between the emission and absorption bands, there is a lot of reabsorption. So I'm a bit skeptical for scintillator applications of them in, in those applications where the light is the, is the key. Muge asks the question about um, if, if you can ask if they can send us an email, and of course you can always send us an email about the analysis of cross-state quantum dots. I'm glad to see that there are people interested in this research area. Um, okay. Anyone else having questions? Uh, yeah, so Sir Pat wrote that, of course, you can, um, yes, please send us email with your, with whatever you would like to discuss about the perovskite quantum dots. <clears throat> Maxim, there is another question from Yavuz. Can we change fuel oil energy? Before the last one. Uh -huh. Can we change fuel oil energy with nanocrystals, hydrogen energy, if even we can? What is the point of selecting fuel oils against nanocrystals? Uh, Yavuz, I, I apologize, but I have difficulties to understand your question. 
Maybe you could um, speak up or rephrase it somehow. More so, question, please. Yeah. Yavuz, maybe you can you can turn on mic or. Okay, I go forward to the next one, which is from August. If I'm not wrong, usually Balperovska is stable at orthorhombic strike, Chetamian condition. You have cubic, is that because of nanocrystal site? So, August, a good point. I actually did not say that our perovskite have cubic crystal structure. I just used cubic structure for simplicity to depict the, the, the crystal structure overall, but you are right. It's never cubic for cesium. It's um, it's actually orthorhombic. So the the lead, the light lead bond angle is not 180 degree. In one of my slides, I had it uh, in the orthorhombic setting, but in a slide which is general for perovskite, I use cubic. But um, but cubic are only the formamidinium based. Metal ammonium are tetragonal and cesium based on orthorhombic at room temperature. So you are completely right. We actually have proof that they are cubic at any size. Cesium lead bromide. Uh, sorry, that they are orthorhombic at any size. Cesium lead bromide. And for mamidinium are cubic at any size. Uh, so just like the bulk at the same temperature. So your question, aha, uh -huh. so Yavuz re rephrased their question. So about energy production with nanocrystals and what is the point of using for fossil oil, I believe. Um, well, oil is, uh, well, has very high energy density. Now with, with uh, probably you refer to photochemical or photoelectrochemical uh, hydrogen generation. I guess it's it's um, it's a meaningful uh, area, but I'm not I'm not the right authority to comment on on on that. Um, yeah, we don't we don't work in that area on uh, in the in the hydrogen generation uh, by photo or photoelectrochemical means. Um, yeah, that would be my answer. Uh huh. I actually like this format to read. It, it's uh, the, <laughs> to read the questions. So, yeah. So, if no more questions, perhaps we can take your final comment, Maxim, and then close the session if you don't mind. Okay. Final comment. Mm, yeah. I didn't think of that, but um, so my final comment would be that probably I will comment on perovskite nanocrystals, and I would say that those who wish to enter this research area, I think it's uh, there are still plenty of problems to work on, and many more than we had six years ago, as usual. Uh, the more you progress, the more work is out there. Uh, applications are huge because you can use these materials in, in this place. You can use them as scintillators. You can uh, do potentially photocatalysis with them. Uh, they are very strong energy harvesting system. There is no real lead free alternative for them. There, I didn't comment on that today, but there is not a single uh, system that can uh, compete with lead-based perovskites in terms of emissivity or absorption amongst metal helots. Um, now, lead-based perovskites, quantum dots have, they are not necessarily better in every regard comparing to indium phosphate or calcium. Each of these systems has have their own merit. For instance, I didn't show anything on light-emitting diets with perovskites because I believe that they are inherently unstable because of electrochemical activity of lead two plus. 
Uh, that's where cadmium-based QDs have higher potential. But for the applications where, where you use down conversion, um, such as LCD displays, I think perovskites will be commercialized in the next couple of years as a, as a television display emitter. Um, I think there is plenty of work in terms of um, in terms of multi-body phenomena and in terms of single dot emission. So the, the, the, for physicists, for example, there is plenty of work to understand these semiconductors. They have very strong exciton phonon and coupling. They have very interesting polaronic effects. And so the physicists all over the world frequently uh, get uh, excited with this material. So, so my my message to chemists among you is that don't be shy to start working with these systems. And if you need any question, ask. And physicists, please don't hesitate to ask for a sample or any, any, any help uh, that you might have. Um, right? So yeah, that was my, uh, my last message on this topic. Thank you. And so thank much. you all for for you for gathering today for this um, seminar. I had very good memories of my visits to Ankara to Bilkin University to Istanbul also. And as soon as I will travel full speed, I will go back to Turkey for sure. It's sure. very very exciting country, very rich in talent, young people who are really really good students and good scientists. Thank you so much. That was a great pleasure to listen to you this evening. I hope we will uh, see you in person in the nearest future. Take care of you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.